welcome everybody and um, welcome to the uh, Tuesday, July 12th meeting of the Milwaukee Mental Health Task Force. I'm Mary Neubauer, one of the co-chairs, and Christine Apple, a uh, psychologist from uh, probation and parole, is our other co-chair with us today. Um, uh, materials for the meeting are posted at our website, which is posted on the agenda. Some materials are posted now, and some will be posted after the meeting. Um, and I'd like to go over the ground rules. And those are on page two. And the ground rules are that, um, thank you for joining us and please follow these ground rules for our virtual meeting. Uh, everyone will be muted throughout the session. We hope to have time after each speaker um, for a few questions. Use the chat. Uh, feature to type your questions. We will answer as many as we can. Um, we have um, sign language interpreters are provided. I'm having a little trouble here with my, uh, here we go. We have sign language interpreters uh, are provided at most meetings. If you need assistance accessing the interpreter, put your request in the chat. Speakers, please say your name before you speak to help with accessibility. Auto captioning is provided. You may turn captioning on or off. Click on the, uh, at, on the what's that symbol called? The carrot. Carrot, thank you. Yep. The it's, carrot you symbol. Can, um, click on show subtitles or um, there's a button that says live transcript CC. That's from me. Okay, button. If you wanna hide the subtitles or view the, uh, the full transcription. And at the top of your video screen, you can choose between speaker view or gallery view, whatever you prefer. So this was for, to make our meetings accessible as possible so everyone can take in the information. Um, save the date for our August 16th meeting. That's our county budget briefing with special guest county executive David Crawley. And Tuesday the 16th is at 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. And our September uh, meeting will include an update with uh, Jennifer Bergerson, who is the administrator um, at Granite Hills Hospital. So we'll go on to item number two. We are pleased to welcome Kevin Klosner the administrator of the Mental Health Emergency Center. And he'll provide an overview of the new Mental Health Emergency Center, which is scheduled to open in September and will serve, serve children and adults uh, that are experiencing a mental health crisis. The Mental Health Task Force has provided some questions in advance and those are listed at the end of the agenda. So Kevin, welcome to the Milwaukee Mental Health Task Force. And we look forward to this conversation with you today. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for thanks to everybody for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I did just put in the chat my my name, the spelling of my name, our address. Um, I'm. You can see this isn't a virtual uh, background. I'm actually in the mental health emergency center. Uh, we open up on September sixth, but we have. Uh, there's still a little bit of work going on, but but it's essentially complete. We've almost taken occupancy completely, but not quite. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen, Mary, and that's always uh, always kind of interesting. Can you possibly see it right now? Yes, yes your screen yes, is up. You're, up. you're up, Kevin. Okay, and I'm going to try to do this and, and put it on so that you you basically just see the presentation. How's how's that? Does it say Mental Health Emergency Center presentation in Milwaukee Mental Health Task Force opening September 6th? No, it's your your PowerPoint and your information around your PowerPoint is up. This is okay. Denise. Yes. Um, you could actually change it to um, show your presentation and then it will be full screen. If you go to slideshow and start your presentation. Okay, I'll tell you what, I think somebody was teed up to share it for me. 
Maybe we should do that just to save some time. I apologize. And then I need to uh, stop sharing. Barbara, is there somebody else that? Yes, thank you. Jeannie is going to uh, show the presentation. Jeannie Parker, thank you, Jeannie. She's just getting that up to share her sure. screen. Sure, sorry about that, Jeannie. It almost seemed like I was going to make that happen, but yeah, you were doing so well. It looked really good. Just needed that slideshow view. <laughs> you think I'd have more gumption there? I would just stick with it, but Jeannie, well, up oh, there we go. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, and we can go to the next slide. This was just kind of an artist's rendering, and I actually have a couple of photos uh, when we go a little further. So I'm just gonna remind everybody, I'm sure most of you know this, but I think it's worth saying, uh, I think it was about four years ago that the joint venture partnership, people started to come together to work on this. Uh, Milwaukee County had made the decision that they wanted to get out of the, or it was best to get out of the inpatient behavioral health and the psych crisis service. Um, as you know, an RFP was put out and Granite Hills stepped up and said, we'll take that inpatient portion of the business. Uh, and now you've got, it was universal and now we have Granite Hills in uh, West Dallas. And, but they said they didn't want to run the psych crisis service. And so that's how this partnership came about. And, Advocate Aurora, Ascension, Wisconsin, Children's, and Frederick, each of them have 12 and a half percent. Audio says plug it in, do a different the speaker not working, check your connection, or use a different. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Kevin, hear you. Um, but I think that there's someone else that's yeah. mic went on by accident. Yeah, Yes, Robin, can you, I think that might be you. Can you please mute or I will mute you. Okay, I'm sorry. But anyway, just so you understand this, this partnership. So Milwaukee County has 50% and the health systems have 50%. Uh, and I have my slide at the end, but I'll say it now. Uh, when they put this together, basically they looked for a partner out of, those, out of those partners, they wanted somebody to be the, either the operating or managing uh, partner. And I, I tease people and I say, um, I don't know if it was that Advocate Aurora was the, the only one that, that didn't step back in time, but Advocate Aurora is the um, managing partner. So myself, physicians that are brought in, nurses, techs, social workers, they're all hired by Advocate Aurora and then basically leased back to the Mental Health Emergency Center, which we shorthand as MHEC. This is a nonprofit, and it's kind of like nonprofit in a big way, meaning um, I believe the estimation when this was done was that this was going to be about an $18 million initial investment in building the building and then startup costs, and then the annual subsidy was expected to be somewhere between 11 and $13 million. We still don't know what that final subsidy was gonna be, but that's why because of this arrangement, instead of Milwaukee County having the entire subsidy, they're splitting it with these four health systems. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. And I mean, you know the mission. PCS is closing and we're opening, but it's really about timely patient-centered recovery-oriented emergency services. Um, and really what we're doing, if I kind of break this down, it's we take people in a crisis situation, we try to stabilize them and then get them to the appropriate level of care. And so that's, I, I mean, to me, that's it in a nutshell. And it is this public and private uh, delivery system. Obviously it's county and all the wonderful services that county has. Then it's just all these services, whether it's the EDs, 
the Rogers, the APH, it's everybody working together. And I will tell you that one of the benefits that's come out of this is that most of us are at the table now working together. And I think in particular, and I, I don't know, Mike, uh, Mike Lappin could, could address this and others, but I think before this, there has been a fair amount of distrust between Milwaukee County BHD and the different health systems. And now you're at the table and you're, an invent, you're invested together in wanting to see this succeed for what I think is the most vulnerable population in the community. It's really done some different things. And we meet on a weekly basis with Mike Lappin, Dr. Schneider, Linda Oshis, uh, the director of nursing from BHS. Uh, we meet with AAH, my director of nursing, um, Jennifer Bergerson is there from Granite Hills. The Milwaukee Healthcare Partnership is represented and basically looking at this and not only how do we stand up MHEC and do it safely and in a way that can uh, address the needs of the community, but also that if we're gonna find the next appropriate level of care for people that we know what those are and that we're all working together. Next slide. So I like to point out some of the differences between, because really county site crisis service, services is closing down on, I believe it's the 9th of September. We open up on, this, on the 6th. So we're supposed to really take over that role in the community. Um, but I like to point out some of the differences because if there isn't a difference, the default is we'll be doing what, what uh, county site crisis services do. But one of the big things is the location. We're at 12th and Walnut. So if you don't know where that is, um, we're just, you can see the Isaac Coggs building just a couple blocks below where it says Google on the screen. Uh, but I, I tell people we're about eight tenths of a mile to the west of Fiserv Forum. And we're about a thousand miles away from that kind of glitz and, and glamor. This investment here is one of the first in this area uh, in quite a while. And I'm really excited about that. I hope it can be a catalyst for more investment in this part of the community. Next slide. Oops. So yes. So it's interesting. Everybody knows that the site crisis services is located out on the county grounds on Watertown Plank Road. And yet 93% of the patients that are seen out there are coming from the city of Milwaukee. And if you take a look at, I talked about 12th and Walnut, our actual address is 1525 North 12th Street. 70% of the patients served by PCS today come from this 53205 zip code and the zip codes that touch us that are contiguous. So I really think, and again, I've only been here eight months, I didn't design the facility. I didn't pick the, the, the land, but as somebody who's coming in uh, kind of from the outside, I think so many things were done right. And we can talk about things that we can do differently, but I think that this is absolutely the right location for the reasons I just mentioned. Next slide. Now I just have some, I've got a few slides and I focused on the outside, but. One of the other differences that you're gonna see between PCS and the new mental health emergency center. And again, this was by design. I'd been to PCS a couple of times. I'm only 5'9". And actually that's when I get up in the morning. After a long day when I've kind of been beaten down, I'm about 5'8". Uh, but even somebody my size, I can jump up and touch the ceiling tiles um, at PCS. When you walk into the mental health emergency center, what you're gonna feel is high ceilings. And it's, I feel like the people who designed it, it's much more of a, a healing environment. Uh, when this was designed, and, and please remember, it was designed by people from county, from caregivers there. Uh, it was designed by people from the different health systems. They went to different parts of the country to see some of the most advanced places providing um, emergency mental health care. And this was, was the design. 
And I'm sure there'll be additional designs, you know, in the future. But I, again, I keep going back to, I think it was a pretty good effort. This was before we had uh, furniture. Can we go to the next few slides? One, one of the questions that came up, and I, I, I'm gonna answer it, but one of the other differences between this center and PCS is we actually have two different entrances. And it, it was said somewhere that the, it's, it's not very inviting on the outside. So I just wanted to show people this, I, I just did, the, this isn't professional. This is me going outside with my camera when I got these, um, I was out Friday, so I took them um, re very recently. But you'll notice we can't have our signage unveiled yet because we don't want people thinking we're open and trying to use the service. But otherwise, this is how it looks today. This is the landscaping. This is our voluntary entrance. So unlike the current PCS where law enforcement might be walking in um, on the heels or in front of somebody who's voluntary, um, here we do have separate entrances for voluntary and involuntary. So this is the entrance that our voluntary patients would use. Next slide. And I have a couple, of, this is the involuntary entrance. And you can see that it's got a covered overhang where um, law enforcement can bring our patients. I think probably most of you know, but today at PCS, and, and we anticipate will be similar, but I suppose the percentages could be somewhat different. It's about 50% of the patients who come into PCS are involuntary and the other half are voluntary. And I give you this to show you a little bit about the landscaping. I promise the lawn will look better in a couple of months when we open, but um, there was a fair amount of work done here. Can we go to the next slide? This is just another angle where you can see the, the voluntary entrance. You see that middle circle with the, the, the bush and the, the flowers. Um, again, these are perennials. So they take a little bit less effort to keep up than annuals. I suppose we could look at that. But then if you look behind that at the landscaping along the building, um, there's more. I mean, I'm here every day. I guess you can get jaded, but I do feel like it's a pretty, uh, a pretty st spectacular building and, and inviting. Can we go to the next slide? We can go through the next ones kind of quickly. It's somewhat redundant. This just shows you some of the landscaping out in front of the, uh, the involuntary entrance. And I say involuntary, but we're gonna use this for law enforcement. Most of the patients they bring in will be involuntary, but occasionally they'll bring in a voluntary patient. We'll just, just so that they don't have to learn a couple of different things and so we don't have law enforcement um, walking in the voluntary entrance. We will make sure that our, our law enforcement um, stakeholders use this entrance. Next. And I did mention this before that Advocate Aurora is the managing partner. Um, and this just gives an idea of, of kind of, we are under the umbrella of this joint venture. We're managed by Advocate Aurora, but I report up to the board as well. That board is represented by four members from county. Um, and it's also represented by uh, four health system members, one each from those different um, health systems. But Advocate Aurora was, was tasked with managing the day-to-day -day operations. And one thing I'll just tell you is I feel like I'm kind of Switzerland as much as anybody can be. I spent my last five years before I took this job eight months ago, I was the administrator of St. Joseph Hospital in town, um, which obviously is an Ascension facility. I worked for Aurora before I joined Ascension. Uh, I worked for them for 14, 14 years. Uh, I like to tell people I paid taxes uh, to Milwaukee County for 25 years. Uh, my wife worked at Children's in one of their clinics for uh, almost a decade. And um, I would be profoundly deaf if it wasn't for Freighter and the cochlear implant uh, that they uh, basically implanted inside me over a year ago. And so I'm grateful to every one of those partners that I mentioned. Um, 
And at the end of the day, uh, see the light there. At the end of the day, I'm committed to this page, patient population and not to any one of oh, those yeah, partners that, that I mentioned. Yeah, okay. So uh, that's really my presentation. Barbara and uh, Mary, if, uh, if people want to ask me questions, we can do that. Or I could, I could start kind of mentioning the questions that were written and then kind of answer it as we go. You want me to go that route? Yes, Kevin, start with the questions that you were uh, provided with, and then we'll, we have time, we'll go on to additional questions. That sounds great. Okay, the first question I have here uh, is just to the mental health workforce is such a challenge right now. Can you fill us in on where MHEC is with staffing, including the following? psychiatrists who you expect will be on staff. So I will tell you that our staffing plan right now is that we will have uh, two psychiatrists on per shift and we will have a mid-level clinician, an NP or a PA on during the, what we think is probably gonna be the busiest time, which will be the, the evening shift. And so we'll also have, uh, four RNs and four, four therapists. That's our plan. We'll have social work and others. But the one difference, and I'll point this out, is that currently uh, BHS at the Psych Crisis Services has three psychiatrists. They, on, at a shift, they don't have what, what we call a collaborative model that includes NPs and P, PAs. Um, I guess that's just a different philosophy. But we have enough providers hired right now, either um, through AAH or through the community or through locums to be able to open safely with that staffing plan that I just mentioned. The, the key right now is you probably know that it takes typically three months to get physicians credentialed and on the medical staff. Um, and so we're in that window, but we believe we're going to make that. And uh, we have every intention of opening on the 6th. I was asked about therapists. Um, we do have therapists. We also, I was asked a question about bilingual staff. And we have hired a couple of bilingual um, Spanish-speaking staff. Obviously, we, we would like to have more than that. But when it comes to language services needs, we are really relying on the backbone of Advocate Aurora and to have the same standards that they have in place for all of their, their services. And I think that's key because, um, you know, obviously it's, it's nice to have bilingual staff, but if your bilingual staff isn't certified, um, then they can't do the actual medical interpretation by law. And so that's something that we're, we're bound by. We are looking at um, peer support. We're working with Milwaukee County um, on that. And actually this is part of that partnership. Um, I think this group, uh, I'm not gonna ask for a, people to raise hands, but I believe most people are familiar with Team Connect, correct? Um, so Team Connect is going to be embedded right here as part of our team. They'll certainly report up through county but I plan to do everything I can to, to make sure that they feel like they're part of our family too. And so they'll be able to, to provide consultation to our patients um, in real time if they have needs that go beyond what we can provide. And I, I think that that's, again, one of those benefits of us working so closely with county today. I was asked about the MHEX philosophy about the use of restraints. And we do have restraints available both in our emergency area and in our six inpatient beds. Um, I will tell you that we will use those restraints as infrequently as we need to and for as short a duration as possible. And so I was also asked, you know, how will you kind of try to reduce the, the use of restraints? And 
I think the biggest thing is everybody here is going to be trained in crisis de-escalation. We want to make sure that that's a key part of what they do and that we follow the guidelines. And that's that we will only use them when patients pose an immediate risk to themselves or others without that fiscal intervention. And so if somebody has been on for a few minutes and that, that fiscal risk is gone, those restraints will be gone. So we'll be measuring the use, um, not just the frequency, but the duration. We also will be, um, basically this is something that we, we would be using in peer review so that if restraints are used, we take a look at it. Uh, we will have a daily safety huddle here where we review what happened in the 24 hours before. We're gonna do that not to try to find fault with people, but so that we see what's happening in real time and we can do what we can to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page when it comes to um, the use of restraints, not just the frequency, but, but the duration. I think that's critical because we're gonna have a number of different providers just like PCS does. Um, and we wanna make sure that everybody has the same standards. And if there's deviation, we bring people right back to where we need to be. And that's gonna be an ongoing learning uh, situation. Uh, I was asked about the experience for people entering the building uh, through discharge for adults and for youth, for involuntary and voluntary. And I, I think I'm gonna have to come back at some point because I mean, obviously there's a lot to that and we're still working on those patient flows, but I do wanna make sure that people understand too that uh, we do have two separate patient care entrances. I mentioned that. And I know I've, I've heard the criticism that those entrances might be too close to each other. And the reason being that um, we are, we are going to have a patient population that we serve that has a distrust of law enforcement. And I do understand that. But I think that this was the compromise. I've talked to people who were involved in the, in the design, and they said there was never any, any intention of having entrances where you couldn't see people each other. And the reason for that is they share an emergency care area. Once you get inside and we take um, custody of a patient, then you can take the patient into an area where voluntary patients may be as well. So law enforcement wouldn't be necessarily be coming in there. That wouldn't be the intention. But if we had two entrances that were so far apart that we couldn't have contiguous area and use that space together, the problem would be you'd have to double the staff. Uh, you'd probably have to have a much larger building. There are just a lot of, so I believe that when this was built, that was part of the, the idea. The other thing I will tell you, and this is a huge improvement, I think from PCS, and Mike would be the first to admit that, is the space that we have. So we have two different milieus for taking care of children and adolescents and for adults in this, in this emergency setting. And I think that that's, and they're, they're designed differently. They provide some different features, um, but that was intentional. The other thing is we do have six inpatient beds, and I should have mentioned this before. Those will just be for adults. So with children, we will need to get them out as soon as we can to find that next um, level of care that's appropriate. But we, we cannot mix in the inpatient setting, adults and children and adolescents. So that is one of the differences that, that you'll see here. Um, we have those inpatient beds because we believe there will be some times when no matter how good the resources are in the community, we may have a hard time placing somebody in you know within a few hours. And so we need to have a place where we can safely take care of people. Um, uh, and I think some people are looking at it more as like observation, but I think our, our thought right now is, and this could change over time, but we anticipate that we'll have a very short length of stay, one to two days. Um, we also anticipate that um, we'll have a low census, maybe two patients or less at any, any given time. And that's intentional. This wasn't meant to take the place of inpatient beds in the community. That's Granite Hills, it's, that's their job. But 99% of what we do is, is going to be in that emergent space. 
the site crisis um, provision of care. There have been questions about um, the limited space available for family members um, outside of, of presenting guard, guardians. And that's, I think that also was intentional. You know, when I was at St. Joe's, um, we had a we had seventy six thousand patients that came through there the ED there on an annual basis. Uh, we had a fairly big uh, waiting area for patients certainly, but also for families. But in mental health uh, psych crisis or emergency services, the idea that uh, family members would would accompany adults into the into the space is it's it's just not. It's just not something that typically happens. Again, I didn't design the, the facility, but it wasn't designed for that. We do have some space and I should have taken a picture of that. I will and I'll, I'll share it with people at, a, at another time. A small place where, um, and, and we're thinking about mostly for um, guardians, parents of, of children and adolescents, um, if, if they're not in the milieu, actually while a patient is take, being taken care of, everything that we do here is, it's always trying to balance the privacy of individuals, the efficacy of the care with the safety for the patients and the staff. And it's, it's just an ongoing balancing act with, with everything we do. And again, on balance, I believe that the design of this place is awfully good. Um, and I say that not as somebody who can take ownership, as I said, of the design. I, the question is what resources will be at MHEC to connect patients with community services, such as mental health, outpatient services, um, assistance with getting insurance. So we will have um, our own financial services staff. We will have people who we will have social workers. Um, we will have Team Connect, as I said, embedded here. Um, we will have uh, peer associates, again, uh, peer assistance through uh, Milwaukee County. So I don't know. I feel like we're going to have, and, and as we get up and running, and, and keep in mind, right now, my real the urgent focus is get this up and running and safe so that Milwaukee County can safely close down and we don't have a disruption in service for this patient population. Um, I, it was also brought up about um, basically whether MHEC should utilize accessibility, accessibility experts to ensure that the center is fully ADA compliant and accessible. And can we share how ADA compliance and accessibility has been addressed and reviewed compliant for compliance? So obviously for us to be able to take occupancy, the state had to come through and assess whether or not we were ADA compliant. We did pass that, we were granted occupancy by the state. I've been asked if we're willing to have other people come through. Um, and I some of those just came in in the last week and I'm trying to work with Advocate Aurora to see what we might be able to do to accommodate that. Um, and I'm, I'm willing to do some of that. The other, the other way that compliance is, is basically looked at is, you know, we will get, be um, certified by DHS and by Medicare. As part of that, there's a certification. A lot of hospitals use the Joint Commission. AAH uses what's called DNV. And I'm not going to give you, it's an acronym, but it started out, I think, in Norway, but it's really been picking up steam lately. One of the nice things about DNV is it's very rigorous, or rigorous, but it's also very collaborative. So what they're trying to do is help you understand where you're missing the mark on different things. And that's from providing the best, best care, if you're missing things on ADA and the whole facility, and then to give you examples on what you can do to try to improve. So instead of being more gotcha, like kind of the joint commission can be sometimes, it's, it's a little bit more constructive. 
which I'm looking forward to. I've been through, literally, I've, I've led um, a half a dozen joint commission surveys. And typically you go through a survey, you're good for three years. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, and I don't know, Mary, if you're gonna give me the hook, you just don't tell me if you need to get me off. We are at time. Um, is, there, is there any one or two other questions you want me to uh, answer? Yeah, why don't you address the fencing question? Okay, so currently there's fencing right by the entrances that I find kind of restrictive. And if you go by toward the end of the day, those fences are closed. This place is entirely closed off. Those will be completely gone when we open. They're just during the construction phase. There's also cyclone kind of, um, I call it industrial type fencing um, on, I can see it at, on part of the building. That will be ripped out and replaced with the black decorative fencing. Um, that fencing will be up. So you can, you can, at any hour of the day, day or night, you can drive in one entrance and you go out the other. So people aren't gonna be trapped in. It's not like, you know, you have to somehow have security let you in and out. Um, I showed you those pictures before. I hope when everybody gets a chance to come through here and it's closer to opening and, and some of that other work is done, people will feel like I do that it is a very welcoming environment. Um, given the restrictions, you know, there have to be clear delineations of when you're leaving the property and when you're on the property. We also have to make sure that there's a very secure um, area for our patients and a secure area for the staff that work here. Uh, people know about some of the things that have happened even on the county grounds. Um, and I think everybody that I have had come through, nurses, um, techs, physicians, security is a big issue. And so I, again, I like to think that we struck a great balance between having the place feel welcoming and also being safe and secure for the patients that we serve and also for the, the caregivers that are gonna provide that service. I have one last question, Kevin. When you talked about staff, do you have a medical director hired in, at this point in time? We have a medical director. He's an interim. His name is Dr. Uh, Krishna Mailavarapu. The problem with Krishna is Krishna is basically covering, he's, he's the uh, physician leader for all of behavioral health for Advocate Aurora. So Illinois and Wisconsin. And I'm telling you right now, I'm getting about 15 hours a week out of him, maybe more. And I worry I'll, I'll burn him out. He's amazing. But in the meantime, you know, I've looked, we have some physicians that are coming over that currently are at PCS. One of them is, is Dr. Julie Owen. She's at, uh, she's at Trader, she's at MCW, and she's in charge of basically when, when patients are seen at Trader, which is the busiest ED in the, in the community. If they have mental health needs, her team that she oversees provides the care. I met with her and I said, Julie, if we have questions about workflow, process flow, anything else, can you be a resource for us? because obviously I'm willing to pay for that. And she said, absolutely. So I like to think I, I have that if we need it. The other one is Dr. John Schneider. Because of this relationship with Milwaukee County, basically Dr. Schneider is working with us on, on a, we meet on a weekly basis, but he's there for any other question we might have. And I think that that's the key. I think the physicians we have all know how to take care of somebody in a mental health crisis. I think the biggest thing that, that we're gonna to need to help with here is when you've got chapter 51, you've got some of the, the designations that have to be determined with TDS. That's where Dr. Schneider is working right now to develop learning modules for our physicians so that everybody who comes in has to take those, all the providers and they have to pass them. And uh, we'll have ongoing education as well. And I just like to point out, that's a level of rigor that isn't there today. So you think about all those physicians that work at PCS, and right now it, de it depends on kind of a one-on-one -on -one and some education, but 
I love the fact we're going to have a rigor around that education that will make those determinations, I, I hope going forward, even more consistent than they might be today. Thank you. Barbara. And then you wrap it um, up. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Just one final question. Uh, and we appreciate all the information you've shared, Kevin. I know that there's a lot of interest in this one. And that's a question that we had shared with you about uh, engagement of community stakeholders. And, you know, that there's been a request for that for, for some time. So would like to hear what your vision is for how that will occur moving forward. Thank you. Sure. Well, one of the things is that on the 25th, um, the advisory board is going to be coming for, I think it's at six o'clock, is going to come in and tour. Um, Dr. Cole brought his team in. He's bringing in another team, I, I hope as early as next week, which has um, the peer advocates, advisors, and, and others on that. Um, we're also reaching out to the community. Um, basically, we're gonna have open houses that are coming up probably in August mostly. And I plan to do something just for the nearby community, um, the neighbors. It'll be something simple like a cookout and be able to come through and take a look at it because I want them to feel comfortable and, and uh, proud of what we're doing next door. If there are other things that people think we ought to do, it's probably in the plan that's been developed that Mike Lappin is, is part of that communications group and that stakeholder group. But if there are other things, you've got my contact information. There's no reason can't re people can't reach out to me directly. And if I can, if I can do something, I will. All right, thank you, Kevin. And um, hopefully we can have you back and have a part two. You bet. Thank you, Mary. Thanks thank everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. You too. All right. Okay, item number three on the agenda. Um, this has been a challenging time for Milwaukee youth, including those with mental health needs. And we have two speakers today who will address the important topic. Uh, DHH Director Shakita Legrand McLean will introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Shakita and Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us here again. Shakita Legrand McLean, Director of Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm I'm happy to be here. I do I know that we're short on time, so I want to go ahead and turn it over to um, our interim administrator Kelly Pefke, um, and she will provide an overview, and then we both will be available for questions at the end. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Director LeGrant. Um, there you go. So uh, yes, Kelly Pepke, I'm the Interim Administrator for Children, Youth, and Family Services. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. This is my first time with this group. So I appreciate um, being able to hear speak about what we're doing here in Youth Justice. And I believe someone was going to be sharing my PowerPoint. Perfect, thank you. Um, we can go ahead and jump to the second screen. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief overview of Department of Health and Human Services. I'm not sure who is aware um, of what DHHS is, um, but on the left-hand side, you see all the different service areas that encompass DHHS. And we're one um, of, the, of the several uh, service areas, Children, Youth, and Family Services. Um, and I think it's important um, to always start out with what our mission, vision, and values are. And so that's why I wanted to include this. Um, because I think we're all here for the same thing about empowering safe, healthy, and meaningful lives, um, creating healthy communities together. And then our values, all that rides really on our values, which is our partnership, respect, integrity, diversity, and excellence. Um, we often refer to that as our pride value. So just wanted to start off and set the stage with that. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I first wanna start off talking about our children's integration efforts. Um, this started, children's integration across DHHS started several years ago. Um, and this is all part of the DHHS no wrong door model. Um, and the goals are really to provide easy access to high quality individualized care um, for everyone in Milwaukee County. And that's for children, youth and families. Um, and with the children's integration that brought together um, a few different service areas. 
So the phase one uh, brought together what was formerly um, the Children's Disability Services House within uh, Disability Services Division, as well as Youth Justice, which was housed under Division of Youth and Family Services. Um, and we're also including Children's Mental Health and Wraparound because being able to service and work with the, the child, the youth and the family um, as a whole unit um, is important. Um, and so with the children's integration, we now have a centralized intake and screening process for all children and youth who, um, for, who may have uh, mental health and disability um, and providing individualized services, person-centered care to them. And the goal for really is to divert youth from the justice system. Um, you know, it's, I think it's important to note that historically, youth who came in through the youth justice door uh, did not receive a disabilities um, or mental health assessment, screening or assessment. So we now have screening, we have assessments for disabilities, for mental health, for substance abuse, um, and that's all been part of the children's integration efforts. Um, we really want to make sure we're setting them up for success in their home and keeping them in their communities. Um, another important component of the children's integration is making sure we're assessing children and youth earlier when they are in the justice system. So we have the no wrong door um, for youth, children and youth who are not in the youth justice system, but if they are, we need to make sure we're working with them from the very moment of intake, um, which includes a screening assessment. Um, we also have a multidisciplinary staffing and central staffing process in place that did not exist before. Um, and again, the intake and functional assessments for justice-involved youth. Um, and as we're continuing to build the bridge, we are being able to get kids screened and assessed very quickly. Um, those that um, may be deemed vulnerable or higher vulnerable, we are able to assess within one day, if not within a couple of days of receiving a referral. And we can go on to the next screen. So part of uh, children's integration, some things that I wanna highlight, uh, we've had increased enrollment both in CLT or children's long-term support waiver, but also in the comprehensive community services or CCS. And with children's integration, we're allowed, we now have youth who are dual enrolled. So you can be involved or enrolled in CCS, CCS and CLTS at the same time. Um, and a huge thing, something I really wanna highlight is the number of kids that we are serving in CLTS has increased significantly. Um, I believe in 2020, it was over 28%. In 2021, it was over 40%. And so we do uh, expect those numbers to continue to increase, which is great, because that means we are working and being able, we're touching those kids that we should be working with um, and really ensuring that they get their, their services that they need. Uh, another part of the integration is collaboration with the aging, with the now as of January, the aging and disability services. Um, and the goal is to support the transition of children and youth as they transition into adult services. So we've been very intentional about identifying where are those gaps and challenges um, and develop, developing solutions for those uh, because we want this to be a positive experience where there's no disruption in services for the uh, children, youth and their families. We also um, are being very intentional about increasing awareness of DHHS um, and bringing those resources that we do have across DHHS to the neighborhoods and to the people that really need them. Um, and I do wanna just highlight, there's been a lot of success um, since the children's integration. We've been able to identify needs within children and youth um, quicker, able to get them home. Um, so an example is we had a youth who, um, was in the youth justice system, had been referred out to us, was screened and assessed, and was determined he, um, this, this youth had some significant needs um, and some uh, identified disability. We were able to enroll them in the CLTS and get that kid home. Um, whereas before, if we didn't, we didn't make those connections and do those screenings and assessments, he could have gone further into the just justice system. And that is exactly what we're trying to uh, prevent. And we can go to the next. So wanting to talk specifically about youth justice here in Milwaukee County. Um, over the last several years, 10 plus years, but really in the last, I'd say, five years or so, um, we've really been shifting how we do, um, how we work with youth, how we work with their families here in Milwaukee County, because um, we really believe that um, there needs to be a shift um, in how we work with kids. 
uh, the historic uh, youth justice system was not working. Um, so we wanna make sure our youth receive the proper care um, under conditions that really promote um, who they are and who they want to be um, and really promotes and affirms, um, oh, uh, it went ahead, yep. So really just about connecting those youth um, to, thank you, to their uh, communities. I know we get a lot of questions um, about kids and corrections. And I just always wanna highlight, we know corrections is not the answer. Um, and as of, to, as of right now, as of July 1st, the cost to send one kid to corrections is $1,178 a day. And that's over $429,000 a year. Um, and so that amount that we're spending to send kids to corrections, which is several hours away in communities and with people that do not look like them is astonishing to what we could be doing here. And if we had those funds here in Milwaukee County. Um, so again, we're shifting the paradigm to address unique needs. Um, we utilize what's called a growth focused uh, case management. And that really looks at who their youth see as their ideal self and really is a very individualized case planning, goal setting um, for the, the youth that um, really meets their needs. But also, also we wanna always keep in mind community safety. Um, but we also believe that the safest communities are those in which everyone has their needs met. And then we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So I wanted to share this slide. It really looks at the youth justice continuum of care. So you can see it from the left to right. Um, we do, um, we are always trying to focus on youth that we can divert from the system, divert from the courts, divert from the youth justice system in general. Um, and that includes preventative efforts. We have the prevention and diversion. And in the center are those youth who should be served through uh, community-based resources and programs. And this could be, uh, we always try to keep the kids um, in their homes. Um, we, they're only removed to an out-of-home care if absolutely necessary for the safety of, of the youth community and to meet their needs. But that is where the majority of youth are served, is really within um, the community-based uh, system of care. And then if you go to the right, again, it curves down because these are youth who are served in our secure setting. Um, we have our secure setting, which is formerly the Milwaukee County Accountability Program, um, which is now the Champions Make Change. We do serve youth uh, in this program in our detention center. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a little bit. Um, and then at the very end, are those youth who are served in corrections. Um, and these, the youth who are typically in corrections do um, have pretty serious charges um, and who have been court ordered there. I do wanna be clear, every kid that goes to corrections is court ordered um, through a judge. And then we can go on. So I do wanna highlight um, some of our services here in youth justice. So we do have 127 bed de youth detention center. Um, this is housed out at Velar Phillips, which is off of Watertown Plank. Uh, it's about Highway 100 and Watertown Plank. Um, and that is where Children's Court is as well and where our staff and youth justice are. So we do have 127 bed center, uh, detention center. This includes the Champions Make Change program, which is, again is an out of home care program where youth have to be court ordered into. And this is really is our response, our alternative to corrections. So um, kids that we feel we can serve, I, we don't want kids going to corrections. We feel we can serve them here in Milwaukee. And, and this program is one of those options. I, I also wanna highlight some other of our services, our Cream City Credible Messengers. Um, this has been uh, a new program for us. We did a one-year pilot uh, the pilot program is over. We do have an evaluation of that program and we have some pretty significant um, outcome data that really shows this is working. Um, and also just talking to the kids, uh, we've gotten incredible feedback on um, the Credible Messenger program. And this is designed, these are transformative mentors. These are people who already live in our communities, who live in the communities that youth live in. Um, they may have history of youth justice involvement or the adult system. Um, and they're really those, uh, we call them transformative mentors, but mentors, advocates, they, they understand these kids, they're able to connect to these kids. Um, and we use this program in two ways. 
where kids can get referred to a credible messenger who are already in the youth justice system, but also uh, law enforcement can refer youth. Um, so if a law enforcement officer comes across a kid um, who they feel um, may be on the edge of being referred to youth justice, maybe engaging in some concerning behavior, they can refer them to a credible messenger uh, instead of uh, making a referral to uh, the, the youth justice system. I do also wanna highlight, we are working very closely with Wraparound Milwaukee and other children's mental health services. Um, we have a variety of services, mental health and substance abuse. Uh, we have a restorative justice um, programming and that's embedded throughout a lot of our different programs. We have the community service restitution. We do have an education intervention and advocacy program. Uh, we work with Milwaukee Public Schools for to work with 20 kids in the schools. And then we also have a community portion of that. We also have our um, monitoring and advocacy programs. We have our shelter care, which is for boys and girls, as typically a short-term placement while they're pending court. Um, and then we also have our children's long-term support program and children's community options program. Um, and what is not on here, I just realized it's our birth to three program. I do wanna highlight that as well. We have our uh, multi-systemic therapy as well as youth employment. And I know there's questions about what services are provided for um, our youth in our detention center. So I do wanna highlight some of those services. Um, we do work with BHS um, and they are able to deploy one of their doctors um, to do assess or assessment, psychiatric um, assessments of kids in our detention center. We also have psychological assessments that are completed of youth in our detention center. We do have a contract with a local community-based provider to do psychiatric nursing. Um, we have medical nursing and doctor uh, staff as well. Um, we do, the Wauwatosa Public Schools provides the education for kids in our detention center. And they have a huge important partner for us um, because they really believe in what we're doing and our mission and vision. Um, and they provide a whole, not only education, but um, rotating ongoing uh, services and programs um, from, the, from people in the community that they bring into the school. Um, we also have some, we, there's a question I believe about what are we providing girls in our detention center? So they get the same availability of services as the boys. Um, we do have our um, CRAE, which is our Collaborative Rapid Advocacy for Youth group that comes in and works with the girls right now. Uh, UW Dance is coming in to work with our girls. Um, and so it kind of, with the girls in detention, we bring in different community partners um, to provide different individualized gender specific services for the girls too. Um, and I think we can go to the next slide. Okay. So I do want to just provide, uh, I'm not gonna go through all this, but I did wanna provide what a system flow chart looks like. Um, because if you're not familiar with youth justice, it can be very confusing on how youth are actually brought out to us. So we do have three ways in which youth are brought out to us. Youth can be brought to our detention center um, where every single youth that we work with um, does get a screened and a decision is made around whether to hold the youth or release the youth. We also have youth who um, are, it, it's called an order in or told to report out to um, one of our staff. Um, basically uh, law enforcement will give them a date and time to come out and report and meet with us, or we go out and meet with them. Um, but then we do have a small number of kids that we work with who are Family Intervention Support Services, or FIST referral. And these are families who have reached out to FIST, which is operated through BHS, um, that they just need help. They need support. Um, they're asking for help with their child. And so um, they, there's a screening assessment, everything done on that end. And then some of those kids do get referred out to us. Um, I do want to highlight every single kid once they're brought out to us, we do have an intake team or the youth assessment team or YAT. Um, so every single kid is screened um, and assessed through the intake process. Um, and some of our intake, some of the screening is, uh, we use a youth assessment screening instrument, which is basically a risk and needs assessment. Um, but that includes screening for mental health, substance abuse, um, peer and other influences, attitude. Um, it has some static 
and dynamic and dynamic factors are those that can change. And so we also screen for sex trafficking. Um, we use uh, the Maisie mental, mental, screen, mental health screen um, and a few other different screening. Um, so every kid does get the same level of screening and assessment. And from there, um, they go through the youth justice system. They could be deferred. They could be no process, which means we just close them out or a petition can be issued by the court. Um, and so once they're court involved, what the court then makes a determination of what happens to that youth. Um, and so the end is either youth are deferred, can be deferred from the system, can be put on deferred prosecution agreement, um, or they're put on an order of supervision in which they are assigned to an ongoing human service worker. Um, human service worker is basically a formerly called probation officer. Um, and then we work with that youth and family through the end of their case. And that's a very high level um, overview, but I just wanted to kind of show what happens when kids do come into our system. Okay, um, so I just wanna share some data. Um, so it is estimated that 60% uh, of justice involved youth have an undiagnosed mental health issue. And again, it's estimated because it's undiagnosed, we don't know. Uh, but we do know the greatest needs identified are around substance use and mental health resources for youth. Um, so in 2021, there were uh, over 250 justice involved youth who are also enrolled in wraparound Milwaukee. Over 80% of youth had a mental health diagnosis and over 89% um, of youth had either an IEP or special education interventions. Um, and then we can go on to the next slide. So when we look at who we're serving here um, in our youth justice system, it's important that we continue to expand what supports we do have. So part of the expansion is our continued expansion of our CCS and CLTS. And I talked a little bit about that earlier, um, but it's important that we continue um, to do the marketing and reaching out and making sure families know about us because if they don't know about families and providers and people working with children and youth, uh, because if they don't know, they're not gonna get connected. Um, so we're continuing to the expansion and reaching out. Uh, we've again launched initiatives to increase screening for disabilities and youth who are justice involved. Um, I do wanna highlight there are over 150 youth and mentor connections um, through the Credible Messenger program. And then um, over 250 young people from youth justice, disabilities, behavioral health programs have enrolled and participated in our employment program in 2021 and 2022. And this was our first um, really opportunity that we worked across DHHS um, to get kids jobs, not just um, um, job related skills, but this is actually paid in play, paid in point employment. Um, and it, a lot of these kids were able to make those connections then too, that lasted beyond just that paid employment. Um, we've also increased coordination, um, increased expansion of our service network, and really looking at um, how we can build capacity across our providers. Um, I do want to highlight another um, opportunity that occurred. We had a partnership between the Milwaukee County Behavioral Health Services and the City of Milwaukee Office of Violence Prevention, where more than 10,000 gun locks were distributed in 2021. So these are all things that we're doing or have done um, and want to continue doing. And I do, the next slide here, um, this is looking at our population of youth in corrections. And these are kids um, who, again, are court ordered to uh, Division of Juvenile Corrections, which is Lincoln Hills for boys, Copper Lake for girls, and then Mendota uh, Juvenile Treatment Center, uh, which is in the Madison area, um, which currently only serves boys. Um, so if you, you can see, looking at the trend, for several years, we were trending down. Um, we've been very intentional about redirecting um, our resources here to Milwaukee, getting kids, serving kids here in Milwaukee, because again, we know that's, um, that's where they should be served. And so uh, we've had a significant decrease in the number of kids in corrections. Um, several years ago, we we're averaging 130 kids. Um, and we got all the way down, as you can see, to um, just under 30. And that number you can see is spiking again. Um, and so it has been going up over the last several months. 
Um, but again, our efforts are not stopping. We will continue um, to uh, divert or divert kids from corrections as much as we can and provide those opportunities here. Um, I do wanna highlight for every kid, again, that goes to correction that does impact what we are able to do here in Milwaukee County. And we can go to the last slide. Okay, I know one of the questions was, what are we doing to bring kids home from corrections? Um, I don't, and I wanna say not only bring them home, but divert them, not from even going there in the first place. Um, so some things I do wanna highlight is our expansion of youth services. We do have our children's joint intake process, which I briefly talked about earlier. Um, we do have a diversion efforts partnership. Um, we have a partnership um, with some stakeholders and community partners. Uh, we do have a grant that has been submitted to Office of Juvenile, Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention uh, related to diversion, diverting youth from the justice system. Um, so we're waiting to hear back on that. I'm very excited about that opportunity. We also have our CYFS Girls Programming Work Group. Uh, again, this is our work group related to identifying the challenges, gaps, barriers to justice involved girls programming. Um, and so we're working with the National Girls Initiative and I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing as we get over to the ARPA funding. Um, we also have a Credible Messenger program and we're looking at expanding the Credible Messengers and also developing our crisis response team. Um, because our credible messengers are out in the community every single day working with youth and families and individuals, and they are responding to different crises now. So we're trying to formalize that and make sure everyone has the resources, training, support needed. Um, we're also um, looking at, it's important that we reduce the use of secure placements, corrections, and detention for youth in a safe and equitable manner. And so what we're doing with that, on the right-hand side, you can see our ARPA funding proposals. So we do, I do want to highlight what we have already approved and implemented and then what we have proposed. Um, so one thing that we do have implemented is our credible messenger expansion. So we did receive ARPA funding to expand our credible messengers um, for an additional uh, few additional, additional couple mentors and number of youth, but we know there's a greater need than what we have so far. So we do include some of that credible messenger expansion and some of our pending proposals as well. Um, we do have a pro uh, ARPA funding around our level two program. Level two is a program um, that allows kids to be out of detention. They have a monitor um, that they work with. They have groups. Um, they have to do face-to-face -face contacts. There is optional uh, GPS monitoring with that as well. But this is an alternative to detention program. Um, and so some of our Pending, so those are approved. Going into what is pending, um, we have three proposals right now that have been approved through the ARPA task force and are going before the county board committee this month. So we should know in the next couple of weeks whether they are approved and we're able to move forward, um, but I'm feeling very help hopeful on that. The first one is around girls and special populations of justice involved youth. And this goes back to girls. We know girls have unique needs that are different than boys. And historically, the justice system focuses on boys. Um, and I, we, I, there is a strong need around what we can do for girls. So this proposal um, really focuses on girls in, secure detention, in our secure detention, but primarily the community. And what can we do differently uh, for girls in the justice uh, system? Because typically, girls in the justice system are here for different reasons as well. Uh, we also have a proposal for um, to expand our Champions Make Change, uh, formerly MCAT program in detention, as well as expand our community continuum of care. Um, so this includes um, like some of the credible messengers, um, includes some staffing um, be, to be able to work with our youth. It includes um, some restorative justice components. It includes collaborations with um, the housing services area, uh, it includes, so, and it includes um, providing additional um, mental health and substance abuse services to kids across the continuum. Um, and this, all of this is, is targeted to keep kids here. Um, so whatever that kid needs, we need to ensure that we can provide it here in Milwaukee so they're not sent to corrections. And then our last proposal that we have pending is our early childhood and family support project. And this targets um, youth or children um, age zero to three, primarily in the birth to three program. 
working with um, a lot of our community partners and stakeholders to expand what we're doing in this program. And a huge part of that is also the family engagement and support. Uh, because everything we do across UIFS, we need to ensure we're including that family. Um, and family can mean a lot of different things to people. So we don't say it's not just parents or guardians, but who is that family for that youth, that child? Um, we also do have, I wanna highlight, we have a zero youth corrections project manager. And this is a position that is grant funded and their primary goal is to work with our stakeholders, um, system partners to reduce uh, youth corrections. Um, and then I'm trying to, th I think that's it. Uh, I know there's questions too. Um, we've gotten questions about Act 185. I do just wanna say we continue to explore all our options. The decision has is still a deferment of the grant from the state, but um, those discussions are ongoing because we wanna ensure no matter what we do, that it really is to move our vision forward um, and that we have the resources to do so. And I think that's all I had. And I know I went over, so um, I apologize for that. But if there's any questions, I did put my contact information here. Feel free to call me or email me. Um, definitely wanna hear if there's any questions, thoughts, input, would love to hear that. Kelly, what you had to say was really important and I afforded you the time to do that. Um, this is such an important topic mm -hmm. and uh, we brought it to the task force and wanted to afford you all the time you needed to cover your PowerPoint. We can make adjustments in the agenda as we go down. Okay, I think I covered everything in PowerPoint, but I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yeah, I think we can take a question or two. Okay. Is there, is there anything in the chat? I can't follow the chat. So mm -hmm. Barbara, is there anything in the chat? Um, this is yes, thank you. Um, let me just scroll back here. I know there is. So um, here is one question. Um, so uh, this is from Melanie with DRW. Uh, it's great to hear about DHHS efforts to better collaborate between youth justice and other, other DHHS programs. I continue to see problems with the delay when kids need to switch from one program to another. Most recently, I heard 14 to 17 days for a child enrolled in CLTS to switch to wraparound or vice versa, even though the child's functionally eligible for both, leading to a gap in services. Are there efforts to reduce the timeline? Yeah, so I will say, um, I'm not sure that should not be happening. And I haven't heard of that happening of that long de delay, but we are working very closely between uh, CLTS and wraparound Milwaukee. Um, we have our intake and screening works with both area service areas. Um, we meet regularly to address any concerns or challenges coming up. Um, so we're definitely, that should not be happening. happening. Um, and I, I would say as those things come up, it is helpful to know about because then we can address it. Um, we do have a new program manager over the Children's Disability uh, mm -hmm. Services programs as well, and he's fantastic. Um, he's very um, engaged and uh, proactive. So I think um, those, it, it, again, if those come up, we would like to know about it. Um, but we do work very, very closely, both across uh, DHHS with Wraparound. Yeah, thank you. Mel Melanie, did your other question get addressed? I see there's another question from you in the chat. Um, I, I don't think so. And thanks for the answer to the first question. So there's actually two more. One I haven't finished typing yet, so I'll just say it instead. So um, the first one was about some specific things that you're doing if you have examples, and we might not have enough time to connect youth to community services and make neighborhoods and, you know, connect with youth and families where they are um, to let them know about DHH services. Um, a lot of your focus was on justice involved youth, but you know, what what are you doing to connect with families and kids before they get involved with the justice system? So I, I can speak to that a little bit from our, from CYFS. We do have, um, we're very, we're involved in a lot of different community events too, which, so this is new for us. Um, so any like events, we partner with the parks. We have a We Care crew, um, which is the parks and some other DHHS and other county um, departments that work together uh, to identify um, different needs, hold different events. 
We do um, any events in the community that we're aware of, we do have staff present just to share information, share what we're doing, um, get the word out about DHHS. We also have our credible messengers who when they, it may not be even youth they're working with, they could just be talking to kids, individual, whoever um, on the street, they know of our resources, they can connect um, these individuals to the resources, at least let them know. Um, and that's from the CYFS side. And I don't know if there's anything else on the DHHS side, Director LeGrant wanted to add. I mean, I think you covered it. Thank you, Kelly. I mean, I think what we've been trying to do as you talk about bringing the services to the people, you know, where they are and meeting that need. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the No Wrong Door. As you've seen the increase, and we didn't talk a lot about the children's long-term support um, services, but we had a 40% increase. And a lot of that was with the increased uh, marketing and uh, sharing information, making sure people knew about the services, working really closely with our stakeholders, people in the community, um, even having some of our um, families who are enrolled in the program to begin to share that information, having community cafes where we had community come and hear about those upstream investments that we're doing. And so I do think that you can see how, again, we're not really trying to prevent that downstream, right, and really focusing on upstream and say, if we can meet the needs of our youth and families earlier on, they don't, they won't end up in the justice system. Um, and so that is a lot of work that we are doing and we'll continue to focus on as we talk about how do we meet their needs earlier on. So even if we talk about the birth of three program, many people don't know that we administer that program in Milwaukee County, right? And so, um, or talk about any other services in the, the county, not just county owned services. Again, as we talk about our vision and mission, it is together we do this work together. That's just not DHHS. We talk about no wrong door. That's just not DHHS. What that means is that if you come through this door, whether or not you're eligible for these service or services or not, we will make sure that you get connected hopefully earlier, right, before you need crisis services or you need to be in youth justice. So um, that has been our focus and we'll continue to do that. And if there's any ideas or thoughts or places that we need to be that we have not been, please let us know. Uh, we have a whole outreach calendar and been out almost every weekend um, this summer and even during, throughout the week to make sure that we are meeting people where they are. And one other thing I just wanna highlight, another example, um, Birth to Three program had a social emotional grant. Um, and with that, they were able to do a lot of marketing and outreach. Um, and another thing they do, they have a Birth to Three newsletter that is distributed. And that, I am so impressed with their newsletter, it has a lot of useful information. Um, so those are just some more examples, but we are, we'd love to, if there's any spaces, places we should be um, that we're not, I would love uh, to be invited and be aware of that. Or so if any connections that you're aware of, I would love it. Sure, just two quick ones I would suggest, and mm -hmm. you might already be doing it, but um, you know, through the public schools, if there's a way that you can get information to like all of the public school teachers and special ed teachers and school psychologists and school social workers, just to make sure that they are aware and can spread the word to families, kids and parents trust the schools and they're already getting that information. Yep. And the other, well, in the other public school districts, but prime, you know, Milwaukee public schools, and then also child welfare. Um, yep. I, I talk to a lot of, well, not a lot, but families get through to me who are in the child welfare system, who have been trying to get in, the right services for their kids from community programs and are not getting them and end up in the child welfare system. So we do, yeah, thank you for both of those. And those are definitely two that we are working with um, in different ways. I will say child welfare, there are ongoing meetings between the birth to three program and child welfare um, to address those gaps and barriers um, because you shouldn't have to be in either system, child welfare or youth justice to get into birth to three. And that should not be a reason why you have another system involved in your life. So we do, and we partner with them um, on the youth justice side as well. So. That is definitely a strong partnership um, and always looking to make it even stronger. And I will say MPS, um, we do work with MPS in a different, a couple different capacities, um, but that is definitely an ongoing need and um, we'll continue to do outreach and work with them as well. But I think the, we talk about MPS too, it's a very large system. So how can we get this information to those actually working with the children? Like you said, the special education teachers and others. Um, so I appreciate that. Yeah, and just if I can add, it's interesting because we have planning meetings with both of them within the next week or two. So NPS, and you know, really the goal is how do we get those resources earlier? Melanie, I think you, uh, you and I have talked about this 
It's like, we shouldn't just start in the high schools, right? To me, we should make sure that we're getting our youth connected earlier on so they're, they end up in the deeper end later on. And then with um, DMCPS, you know, just really having those conversations about how we can be more collaborative, right? How do we work together um, to meet the needs of youth and families? And again, when we think about government, uh, think about our community. Many of them, don't, they, families don't trust you know, the work, the systems, right? And so how do we rebuild that trust? How do we work together to say, listen, even if you were referred to this service, this program, right? How do we make sure that we are doing what's best for the family, that unit, providing those services and resources so they eventually don't need our services and programs? That's what we want, right? And even as we talk about youth justice, I mean, it is not the goal. You know, we, we talk about this, uh, we wanna incarcerate fewer youth, you know, but we wanna do better than that, um, better than incarcerating youth at all. And that means we need to provide those services and resources earlier on and do more prevention work. And I did see another question in the chat. Um, I think we probably better wrap up now, but there were okay. a few requests for people who are interested in the link for your zero to three newsletters. So that might be what you saw, Kelly. Oh, okay. I will get that link. Um, I'll get that sent out then. Wonderful. If you send that to me, I can share that in the list, sir. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. All right, Barbara, are we going to do an adjustment on the agenda? Um, yes, would you like me to introduce yes, our, our next speaker? And yes, Rob please. Okay, great. Right. I believe that our next speaker, um, Robin Dorman, is here. And um, well, we're so grateful to Shakita and Kelly for their very informative presentation and feel like it's a great follow-up that now we can hear from someone else who is a great advocate for youth in our community and particularly for youth with mental health needs. And that is Robin Dorman, who is the regional attorney, attorney manager for the um, state public defenders program here in Milwaukee. And Robin and her team work so hard and so tirelessly every day um, representing people with mental health needs. And particularly our youth at a time that is so challenging. So Robin, we, we think you're here. <laughs> I messaged I'm here. you. So. Oh, wonderful. So thanks for um, sharing with us today. And thank you so much for all the important work that you and your colleagues do. Take it away, Robin. Thank you. And um, good afternoon. I want to start by introducing one of my colleagues who's um, involved in representation of children in the mental health system. Rachel, are you here? I don't see. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Rachel Ebert is one of the really important colleagues that Barbara was referring to. And I'm actually going to start with um, asking Rachel to describe what happens when children um, are brought in at Chapter 51 cases. Yeah, so my name, uh, my name is Rachel Ebert, and as Robin said, I am one of the attorneys in the Juvenile Mental Health Office. Uh, before Robin kind of talks about delinquencies and CHIPS kids, um, I am more than happy to talk about what happens from the mental health side of things. Um, and some people may or may not know, once a child goes through PCS and is admitted to a hospital, they have the same right to counsel as adults. So they get an attorney just like an adult would. Um, I receive a petition, I meet with the child, I discuss their options, their rights, and kind of what happens next. Um, every kid is assigned a doctor on their unit uh, at whatever hospital that they're at. And that doctor recommends if the child should go through the court process or if there is something else um, that they, the child can do instead of going to court. Most of my child clients are not court hearings and do not ever see a commissioner or a judge. Um, that's generally pretty rare. The general consensus between the parties is that we do not want to have children committed. We don't want to start the process to a civil commitment. Um, most kids do not want to go to court, do not want to see a judge, don't want anything to do with it. So most of the time, the children are stabilized with medications and discharged back to the community. Um, 
So I guess what happens to these kids when they're discharged? It, it depends. Uh, in my experience, there's often not too much. Um, many of these kids have a lot of trauma. They need resources to address that trauma. Many of my clients are also Robin's clients and go through the chips and delinquency system, which she'll also talk about. Uh, but I am unaware of any mental health specific services that are given to a child if they are discharged without any sort of court order. Um, as I said previously, most children are not, not, do not go through the court system. They are not under any court order once they're discharged from the hospital and they often get more services through the juvenile justice system. Um, in my experience, there really is no follow-up by BHD or the private hospitals. It's generally up to the parents or the guardian or group home or wherever the child is to kind of keep that child on track um, and keep up with their mental health. From my perspective, resources can be very scarce. They're primarily used for adults. Um, and that's certainly something that could be helpful in the future with the Mental Health Emergency Center, with Granite Hills taking over, um, to have more mental health related services for kids. Um, just one other issue that I wanted to touch on with my mental health clients um, is their perspective with their interactions in the system when they are brought in or they are detained. Um, it is usually by many officers. They report that it's not just one or two police officers involved. It's generally a group of officers. Um, when a child is taken to BHD, the police are involved probably 99% of the time. There are other ways to get a child taken into custody for purposes of mental health, but most of the time it is police. Um, my clients report that they are always in handcuffs, and I believe that is the policy for when a child is brought in. But the child is traumatized by that encounter. They are taken to a hospital where they don't have any freedom. They're very confused. They're very scared and they don't know what's going on. Um, so Robin and I, when we were discussing this, our, I guess our suggestion of what can be done to help in this situation is that there's definitely a need for first responders with an expertise in, I guess, de-escalation and mental health crisis responses. So we as the attorneys are not on scene, but when we get the reports and when we get records, I would argue that it's it's more of a typical police response rather than a medical mental health response aimed toward children. Um, because there is a difference between children and adults. And it would be lovely if there was someone who could help intervene in those situations to make it less traumatic for the child. Um, Kevin did touch on something that there will be a separate youth area for kids coming into the mental health emergency center. So that is good to know. Um, and I know that we have questions for what happens once BHD closes and what, what other things might be done to help children in the mental health system. But um, I know Robin can talk more about that. Maybe. <laughs> um. I didn't um, expect that I would be going head to head with Kelly Pathke. I really respect Kelly and everything CYS is doing for children and the beautiful vision they have for treating children and I and delivering services at an earlier point. Um, but in the youth um, justice system, we see um, children with mental health issues that really are not addressed in a way that um, prepares them to be adults and not enter the adult system. Because that's our goal, to keep children in the youth justice system and not going forward into the adult system. And um, what Rachel touched on is that when we fail to make clear and deliberate handoffs from um, the hospitals and the chapter 51 um, youth to the community, we are really failing our kids because what happens and oftentimes is again, the police come in and become, you know, 
the um, the arbiters of where the child goes. So I don't know if it's just my caseload or the other lawyers in my office experience the same um, the same um, the same things. But we wanted to um, talk about a couple of examples that have actually come into the system right now. Um, we are um, short on resources, staffing in um, the youth justice system is just as um, scarce and troubled as staffing in all of our um, institutions. And, um, and it's problematic. Our wait lists are, you know, really unbelievable. Um, and I, I, as I said, I don't want to be the foil for everything that Kelly has already discussed, but I think we have to know what the reality is. And um, my staff and I see the reality on a daily basis. And this is a real cause for concern and alarm by this organization, because I know how much you care um, and are concerned about children receiving the mental health services that they desperately need. So one of the areas, Barbara asked us to identify a couple of issues. And one of the areas is this handoff from the hospital into the community. We don't see it. But what we do see is when Rachel represents a child in a Chapter 51 case and the child is released from or discharged from the hospital. And then I see the child in either a child in need of protection and services case um, which is a CPS case, um, uh, you may um, know that language better, or in the delinquency um, area. And I have an example of just last week where a child was released from a Chapter 51, and the mother was very concerned about taking her child or picking her child up. And she did contact CPS and they told her that she would be, um, there would be a neglect petition if she did not pick up her child from the hospital. And she was very upset and she became um, a little um, dysregulated, I'd say. And the police stepped in and asked what they could do to help. And they said, well, you can make a, you can, um, you can bring a charge against your daughter. And so instead of going smoothly from the hospital into a mental health, um, not another facility necessarily, but you know, um, but you know, services that and structured services that could um, ensure the mother would be safe and also provide um, services for the child, the child came into the delinquency um, side of the youth services and um, she was charged with a disorderly conduct with the enhancer of using a dangerous weapon which in this case was a fork and you know i mean they the um hsw the per, um one of the members in kelly's office um came in with a recommendation of a deferred prosecution agreement at our first hearing. And um, he indicated and advocated in a really strong way that a DPA was the best way um, to proceed in this case. And um, and the um, and and indicated that the mother was also in agreement. And this is and this is great. Um, diverting and deferring prosecution is is usually the best way to proceed um, because there's always the fear of getting drawn deeper and deeper into the system. And in this case, it's a perfect example of CYFS with um, their assessments and their recommendations being where they were not heard by the court. And instead, the district attorney who argued strenuously against the DPA and indicated that another option would be available to this child um, 
basically won the day and won over the mother of this child with the promise of so many services being provided by the youth justice system. And be that as it may, usually these are setups for our children who are dysregulated and do have outbursts and do have moments when they are going to need experienced indiv individuals um, who can help them de-escalate. But what often happens and may happen in this case, depending on the ultimate resolution, is that the child goes from a deferred prosecution recommendation deeper and deeper into the system. And that just isn't a good place for our kids. And I think we can all imagine a different world where um, that does not have to happen and it should not happen. We have, um, we know, um, we talked a lot about Lincoln Hills and um, Copper Lake today. And we know that um, the 12 girls that are presently at um, Copper, um, at Copper Hills right now, Copper Lake School right now, um, um, their administrators advise us that they all have serious mental health needs. And we know that. And there is, there is a program, Mendota Juvenile Treatment Program, that's available for boys who are sent to Lincoln Hills to then get mental health services at Mendota, but there is not a similar program for girls. And one of the things we just thought of is since we have 12 girls who are at Copper Lake School right now, couldn't we bring in the people and create our own um, girls juvenile treatment center similar to what the boys have but the institution Copper Lake and Lincoln Hills are also suffering from staff shortages and the inability to um, get new staff and recruit new staff and um, as much as that makes sense bringing um, psychiatrist psychologists up to Lincoln County is often um, a real heavy lift um, but but it just shows you that, you know, um, at least the females in the juvenile in the youth justice system often find themselves getting deeper and deeper because of runaways and because of their own um, inability to control their behaviors and finding themselves in the deepest part of the system, which none of us want. Um, and again, um, numbers are going up at Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake, and they're going up for a reason. They're going up despite the fact the institutions are supposed to be closed. They're going up because we don't have alternative resources. Um, Kelly discussed, and um, I'm looking through my notes because I still refer to the program as MCAP, but she calls it Champions Make Change, I believe, which was the um, Milwaukee County Accountability Program. And today we have, I believe, a wait list of 19 kids to get into that program. And the wait list means that children are sitting in secure detention, waiting for an opening to get into Champions Make Change Program. And that's difficult. So we, um, I think we have some excellent ideas and excellent programs, but at this point in time, we are really in a very serious situation, especially when we know that um, many of the youth that are in the youth services um, um, area are um, suffer from serious mental health issues. Um, another case that um, came across my desk, or we were actually in court um, today, is a child I met when he was 12. His mother had um, been seeking mental health services and obtaining mental health services since he was four. And there was an excellent court report that outlined all his previous treatment history. And in this case, when the young man was acting out, 12 years old, really the cutest kid you ever did see, um, 
he, um, his mom called the police because she wasn't able to control him. Police came, and as Rachel pointed out, they came on force. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember how many um, police squads were um, sent to that house, but there was no one there who knew how to de-escalate a situation for a 12-year-old who was really out of control and really needed a professional to step in and help. Instead, the child and this is hard to even describe, was uh, taken into custody ultimately, and he was hogtied in the back of the squad. Now, one thing that um, we have um, available to us when children come into the youth justice system is we have the opportunity to get the police reports, and we get to see the body cameras that are on the police um, uniforms and also the squad cameras. So we were able to see exactly what happened in this situation. And in this case, the DA, DA recommended and agreed to a deferred prosecution agreement and also a referral for a CHIPS petition, a Child in Need Protection Services, to get into the CPS side. And all that was um, well and good, but once a youth is you know, in the system with rules and um, and obligations and programming to perform, sometimes things don't go exactly as we hope. So the next time the um, child acted up, the mother put him in the car and drove him to the police station. He's now 13. And the police come and surround the car and order him out. And he reacts very badly. And you can imagine he is again facing charges of battery to a police officer and um, and a host of other things. And um, the DA again, understanding his trauma, his mental health needs and issues, agrees to reduce it to a misdemeanor battery. And so he has a misdemeanor and he is placed on supervision and he is given resources and um, and help, but it's these cases have a life of their own once they're in the system. And there were violations, and um, he met other youth in the system who had a you know had different experiences and maybe not more criminogenic needs than he did. But of course, he make these are the friends he made, and two seconds later, he's out with them, and. I'm not proud of this, but today I pled him to two felonies and we resolved the case with placing him in a residential treatment facility. And I'm crossing my fingers and really hoping that he can make it and then this will be the programming that um, helps him. But you can see the progression that happens when we take children. Oh, and the one thing I wanna say is when he was 12 years old and in back of that squad, he was screaming at the top of his lungs for his mother and also screaming, take me to Rogers, take me to Rogers. I want to see my therapist, take me to Rogers. And I um, and he was naming his therapist and um, yet he was brought to the juvenile detention facility. So as I said, these cases have once youth are involved in the justice system, things happen that, you know, we sort of lose control over. And I think, you know, finally a case I had on Friday was a child who entered our system with, um, you know, a history of um, mental health issues. And, um, and he was, um, and also um, committed, or I think yes, committed a crime and a fairly serious crime. And yet this, um, the judge and the team recommended that he be placed in a residential treatment center. And he was, and he was surrounded by an excellent team from all of these um, areas that um, Kelly has mentioned. And they did their best work. And Friday, we had our last hearing and it was a review to see how he had done. He had been discharged and he was returned home. 
And I was thinking this was just going to be your standard um, congratulations, good luck in the future. And instead, I um, enter the Zoom hearing, and there's my client appearing from the Milwaukee County Jail. And that, of all things, is the most heartbreaking. And um, all the wonderful people who work very, very hard to help them, we still have the issue and of sending children back to a, the same neighborhoods, the same with the same issues that of housing and um, um, and all the other issues of poverty. And we have to remember that that um, if we take kids away from the community that they live in um, and try to fix them outside of the community, they still ultimately are going to re-enter the community and with all of their same needs and troubles. So I was heartened to hear about um, um, possibly uh, making connections with um, moving juveniles and youth from the juvenile justice system to the to maybe getting services when they age out. I know Wraparound has been really working on that type of program, but I'm I I I just live these um, stories every single day, and I'm these um, stories come from just this week, and um, and I worry that we are missing connections, and we as many um, goals as we have, and as many ways that we want to. Um, refashion the way we look at youth justice that in some ways it reminds me of the um, um, of comments that are made that prisons and jails in the United States are our biggest mental health hospitals. And I have to say that those are that the children who are deepest in our system and um, are sometimes finding or leaving our um, justice system with felony tags and all the collateral consequences of having felony records um, are the children with probably the most mental health needs. And so I guess I'm reaching out to this group because you seem to have the best ideas and the most interesting ideas of how we can support our children and basically divert them from um, the youth justice system. Um, I guess I'll take questions and I see that a lot of chats, um, but I can't really, I'm having a hard time. Um, um, Barbara, are we gonna, what are we gonna do? We've got 10 minutes left. Um, well, Mary, what do you think about if the information that you and I were going to share, if we send that via email? I just feel like yeah, I think so. It's such an important discussion, and yes, I think so. That's fine. I, I wonder if Pete can Pete Kinesny is is still here because um, I'm just thinking about the topic we were talking about for our Karen Avery Forum, and you know, looking at opportunities for system change and the very issues Robin is talking about. Pete, are you still here? Is Pete in the audience? No, okay. He comes up in the chat, maybe he's not able to speak. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I just, um, the, the themes and the issues that have been raised today that Robin and uh, Rachel shared with us are so important. And I think we really wanna continue the dialogue. It feels like, um, you know, the shortages in the mental health system right now and what the crisis teams are adding to some already major challenges. I, I just wonder their models in other communities, like, um, you know, the, the whole situation with the interaction with law enforcement. I mean, I saw Mike put something in the chat about the MUT team, but I thought that we don't have that youth crisis team any longer because of the challenges with the workforce. Um, so I just wondered, are there other models? Do other um, 
other communities have like a peer advocate or something or other types of advocates who might be there to um, interact with youth um, if mental health professionals aren't available or to provide some kind of oversight. I mean, what you're, what you're sharing is so concerning. I don't know if Mike is still here either. <laughs> Is Mike Lappin out here? Yeah, thanks, Barbara. This is Melanie again. Yeah, I saw that post from Mike, and um, I'm not sure the current status of the youth crisis, um, what I generally hear. And again, I'm not trying to like criticize. I'm, I'm in agreement with Robin and Rachel, and I absolutely support what Shakita and Kelly are trying to do and their, their vision. But what I hear is that when parents try to call that, they either hear call the police or, you know, they have to leave a message or, you know, we'll get back to you in several hours. And that's not helpful. That, I mean, parents, families, they need help now. So then they feel like their only choice is to call the police. Either that or they had some bad experience with Mutt at some point in the past and, and know it's the same thing and, and are unhappy about it and have that distrust. So those are the reports I get when I talk to parents about that. I don't know if Robin and Rachel have anything to add. I, I was just going to add that I have not, um, I have not seen a Mutz team note for a long time. So I, I did, I did not know that they were still operational. I haven't seen uh, any of that on any of my cases. So my understanding was that they were not operational. Um, and, and Melanie is correct. Parents, parents call the police because if they call BHD, it's not necessarily a quick or timely response, um, whereas they call the police and the police respond. So that, that's been my experience. And not to be negative, <laughs> but it, it, is, um, it is somewhat of a uh, revolving door and can be, it can be very negative, so. Okay, May I just, Matt, you wanna take the back to speak? Lene. Le Leanne, is that who you're yeah, calling on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. I'm Leanne Elser, and I work with Children's Community and Mental Health Services in Rapper, Milwaukee. Children's Global Crisis is, in fact, in, in, in existence and operational. They unfortunately have faced many staffing challenges and are in the process of hiring now. So, what they've done is reduced the number of hours of availability. And, like the adult crisis team, the after hours calls go through 211. Additionally, they've paired with the adult mobile crisis team staff so that they have increased their capacity. It doesn't mean, though, that they're fully at capacity or, or the capacity that they were at pre-pandemic pre or the capacity that they need to be at to serve all the needs of the community. Um, but they do, they do still exist. They are in operation. One of the things that we really, really hope to work with the community on is to, and, and I understand there are many barriers and, and challenges with this, but to get in the habit of calling mobile crisis prior to calling the police because we want to avoid many of the things that you all have, have shared today. Um, in addition, there are a number of new resources for youth that the community at large may not yet be aware, aware of. And so funneling and those, uh, those calls through children's mobile crisis gives families greater access to broader options um, simply because they have more knowledge of the resources at their disposal than law enforcement does, for example. So um, again, while I understand there are lots of challenges and don't deny that, um, I, my hope is that we could maybe keep trying um, just to try and avoid some of those, those um, paths that, again, were, were exemplified today. I would, I just wanted to add another piece, and that is um, because we were really struggling to figure out, you know, um, what recommendations we had. But so, um, when you look at how the school system works as far as um, their expulsion process, um, if a child has an IEP, um, there's always a manifest and you know, there's some incident in the school and they're um, targeted for expulsion. Um, there's always a manifestation hearing. 
And at that manifestation hearing, the issue is, um, was the act, was the event a manifestation of their mental health um, issues or um, um, disabilities? And, you know, that's sort of an interesting way of looking at things. And if the juvenile justice system, which is, you know, in some ways very much like the criminal justice system, um, looked at things as, looked at events and actions as potentially a manifestation of their mental health um, issues or their trauma and really, you know, looked at it that way, maybe we'd have um, different outcomes. I guess I'll keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just say that we the reports that we um, that people generate on our on our um, clients um, are all you know are very are very well done and very detailed and um, generally detail you know very long histories of mental health um, interventions and context, but once we're there in the courtroom deciding on how this case is going to be resolved, we sort of forget in, um, many times about you know the trauma that we have outlined and discussed and the mental health issues. Well, I know we're a minute left. I was just going to say, um, I think that we'll have an opportunity to continue the really important discussion that you've kicked off today or that you've continued today um, with the, the forum that we are planning for the fall for our Karen Avery Forum. So Robin, if you have not heard yet from Pete Knizny, um, I'm sure that- Oh, you I've heard. <laughs> Uh -huh. I've heard from Pete. <laughs> <laughs> well, recently. <laughs> he gets out there. <laughs> he will be in touch, and uh, I'm sure he'll be reaching out to others as well. And we really want to work together to see how, with such formidable challenges, how we can come up with some strategies to really shake things up and to change the process. And so. I think it'd be really helpful, um, you know, to, you know, include our mental health attorneys who um, are with our children in the chapter 51 cases, um, because it, it, they should, they should know where their clients are going next when they leave the hospital. And as you can see, that's, you know, we don't get that information or know how to support our clients once they're released. Well, thank you so much, Mary. Do you want to wrap us up uh, with the understanding that this discussion is, this is just this getting started. <laughs> this will be um, I'd like to thank Robin and Rachel for their insight and input. I mean, it doesn't get any more real than this. And um, uh, just as, as Robin reflected on some of the, the court cases, I, I could just reflect myself being one of those kids and what the, my scenario would have been like had it carried out. And I, I could just place myself emotionally into that trajectory of what, what those girls went through, uh, just knowing what my history is. And um, so what's gonna happen, this is the beginning of a conversation. Uh, we will be having the Karen Avery Forum this fall. And this is the topic that we will be talking about so stay tuned for information that will be unfolding in the next several weeks. And um, there's a small subgroup that's uh, that met on Friday to get the ball rolling. And um, so um, this is a critical topic. We've talked about uh, uh, this topic being a, a topic of, of special need for the mental health task force. So that will be happening. Um, you can look uh, in the email for the other items that Barbara and I were going to speak to today, openings on the steering committee for the task force and the upcoming elections and information of that need. Um, 
come back for our meeting in August, and that will be the meeting with the county executive and the um, uh, budget, uh, the budget items, uh, and the department heads giving uh, their budget issues, uh, their budget forecasts, and uh, that will be the second Tuesday in August. And I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but thank you for being with us today and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening and have a good week. Yeah.